This is Basic Topics in Anesthesiology, General Anesthesia. My name is Ryan Romeo. I'm an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And I have nothing to disclose. We're going to start this talk with the stages and signs of general anesthesia. The following elements of the nervous system are depressed during general anesthesia. The sensory, or afferent, motor, or efferent, the autonomic, and consciousness. The stages and signs of general anesthesia were first characterized by a gentleman, uh, Dr. Gly, Guide, who published a fundamental guide to inhalation anesthesia back in 1937. His observations were of unpremedicated patients during diethyl ether anesthesia. And he used physical signs involving respiratory changes, ocular signs, and skeletal muscle changes. Starting with stage one, known as amnesia or analgesia, this begins with induction of anesthesia. During this stage, patients can still respond to commands. They're mildly analgesic during mildly painful stimuli. Their pupils are small and divergent, and muscle tone and reflexes remain intact. Stage two is delirium or excitement. This stage starts from the loss of consciousness to the beginning of rhythmic breathing. It's characterized by uninhibited excitation. You may have uncontrolled movement, laryngospasm, vomiting, hypertension, tachycardia, and hyperventilation during this stage. This usually passes through quickly on induction, and it's more often observed during emergence than on induction. And pupils at this stage are dilated and divergent, and respirations are regular, are irregular, and laryngeal reflexes are depressed. Stage three is surgical anesthesia. This stage starts from regular breathing to respiratory arrest and has four progressive planes. First plane, there's slight muscle relaxation, regular periodic breathing, and active ocular muscles. In plane two, the eyes become immobile and inhalation is shorter than exhalation. By plane three, you have diaphragmatic breathing and relaxation of the abdominal muscles. In plane four, paralysis of intercostal muscles, irregular breathing, and dilated pupils. Stage four is overdose or apnea. Uh, this stage starts from the onset of diaphragmatic paralysis and can go all the way to cardiac arrest. You see shallow or absent respirations, dilated non-reactive pupils. Most reflexes are absent. Circulatory failure at this stage may occur. And if this stage is reached, you must decrease the anesthetic depth in patients. In conclusion of the stages and signs of general anesthesia, the depth of anesthesia can be estimated according to clinical signs. The depth should be thought of as a continuum. It will include light, moderate, and deep at various stages of the surgical procedure. And a bispectral index monitor, or BIS monitor, which is discussed elsewhere in this uh, anesthesia review, uh, may be used to help monitor depth of anesthesia. Next, we're going to talk about awareness under anesthesia. Starting with the incidence, it's very high in obstetric patients, anywhere from 0.4 to 7% of cesarean sections under GA. It's about 1% of the general surgery cases. There is an increased incident in cardiac surgery. And emergency surgery for trauma has a very high incidence, upwards of 11 to 43% incidence of awareness. There's different periods where patients are at risk for awareness. In the preoperative per period, um, awareness is seen with uh, defaciculating doses of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants or during awake intubations. Uh, intubation after induction is another time, as well as intraoperatively, uh, secondary to light anesthesia, patients may be aware. Postoperatively, usually is when muscle relaxants are used without adequate sedation and patients are aware but are not able to, to really indicate uh, what's going on postoperatively if they still have some residual muscle relaxant on board and 
have difficulty uh, communicating that. So monitoring for awareness can be done in a few different ways. There's the EEG, which does not reliably detect awareness. The bispectral index, or BIS monitor, which is discussed elsewhere. Uh, there's pulse volume plasmography. This may show vasoconstriction with insufficient anesthesia. Clinical signs, uh, these may suggest arousal, but not necessarily recall. And also lower esophageal contractility. This declines with general anesthesia. Prevention of awareness can be done with the following. Certainly the use of all tile anesthetics. Also, midazolam and scopolamine both have potent amnestic properties. And also keeping conversation in the operating room to a minimum, especially during induction and emergence. Next, we're going to talk about different general anesthesia techniques. These include inhalational, total intravenous, and combined inhalation intravenous. Starting with inhalational technique, inhaled anesthetics, which are currently in use, include nitrous oxide, which of course is a gas, isofluorine, sevofluorine, and desfluorine, all volatile agents. For induction, inhalation anesthesia is commonplace in pediatric anesthesia, relatively rare in adult anesthesia, and most often sevofluorine is used being that it's non-pungent and can easily be inhaled. Advantages of this technique is the ability to take a patient deep in a fast period of time, thereby by avoiding some of the unwanted side effects of stage two of anesthesia. Spontaneous ventilation during this technique is preserved with a gas induction. Patients regulate their own depth of anesthesia and may be used in the approach to the difficult airway. For maintenance, the advantages of the inhalation technique include that it's easily administered, easily titrated, highly safety ratio in terms of preventing recall, and depth of anesthesia can be quickly adjusted. Also, the, it's effective regardless of body habitus or age. It's good for relaxation of skeletal muscles, in most cases, it preserves cardiac output and cerebral blood flow and a predictive recovery profile. The disadvantages for this technique include the absence of analgesic effects, association with postoperative nausea and vomiting, there is potential for carbon monoxide poisoning, and potential for hepatitis. The next technique discussed <clears throat> is total intravenous, known as TIVA. TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia. It's the use of only intravenous anesthetics, both for induction and for maintenance. And to use this technique, an infusion delivery system or continuous infusion should be used. For induction, the advantages of this technique include quick onset, quick offset, achievement of predictable plasma concentrations, but disadvantages include causes apnea, can cause hypotension or pain on injection, or even reflex tachycardia. For maintenance, total intravenous anesthesia advantages include rapidly reversible. There's, it's very easy to administer and reduced post-operative pain. Well, the disadvantages are higher cost, a lack of muscle relaxation, uh, so if desired, you'll need a muscle relaxant with this technique. And an increased perturbations in hemodynamic secondary to pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of the IV drugs. Lastly, we'll talk about the combined technique. This is the most common general anesthesia technique. IV induction in adults with inhalation and intravenous for med maintenance. And this allows for the desired advantages of both with the reduction of disadvantages of both. Next, we're going to talk about airway management. These will be eight different topics. Number one, the assessment and identification of difficult airway. 
Then number two, the techniques for managing the airway. Three, talk about devices. Four, alternatives and adjuncts. Five, transcutaneous or surgical airway. Six, endobronchial intubation. Seven, intubation and tube change adjuncts. And number eight, endotracheal tube types. Starting with the assessment of the difficult airway. There are several anatomic correlates to uh, indicating or to identifying a difficult airway. If the patient's mouth opening is less than four centimeters, if their thyromental distance, which is the distance from the hyoid bone to the mandibular symphysis, is less than six centimeters or three finger breaths, if they have a neck mass, a fixed larynx, any mandibular abnormality, macroglossia, which is large tongue, deep, narrow, or high arched oropharynx, protruding teeth, and or a short, thick neck. Melampotty classification is useful. If when opening the mouth, the patient has, you can see uh, the exposure of the soft palate, the entire uvula, and the tonsillar pillars, we call that a melampotty one. A melampotty two is the exposure of the soft palate and just the base of the uvula. Melampotty three is the exposure of the soft palate only. And melampotty four is visualization of no pharyngeal structures except the hard palate. And, and as these classifications go from one to four, certainly becomes more difficult potentially to intubate that patient. Other ways of assessment of difficult air, we look at the range of motion. Neck movement, if it's less than 80%, this may be predictive of a difficult intubation. They may have a decreased range of motion, secondary arthritis, spondylitis, or disc disease, making it more difficult to, to extend their neck to intubate, or if they're in a C spine collar. Now, there's different techniques for managing the airway. There's an awake technique versus a sleep technique. Um, awake technique, you, know, you can do an awake look with a direct laryngoscopy. You can do an awake look with a glide scope. You can do an awake fast track LMA, an awake fiber optic intubation, which can be oral or nasal, or an awake tracheostomy. These are all ways to intubate patient while they're awake if it looks like it would be difficult to intubate them and not be able to ventilate them. When doing awake techniques, uh, drug selection is important. You want to use an antisilagogue generally, such as glycopyrrolate to help cut down in secretions, a sedative such as midazolam, small amounts of propofol, or even dexmetomidine. You may want to use an analgesic very sparingly, such as fentanyl. Local anesthetic for different blocks, such as lidocaine, cocaine, or tetracaine and a vasoconstrictor like afrin or phenylephrine help cut down on the potential for bleeding, especially if doing a, uh, a technique through the nose. Different techniques for managing the airway continued. We'll talk about retrograde intubation. This slide just shows the anatomy of the area where you would be doing a retrograde intubation. If you look at the uh, picture, starting at the bottom, shows a um, cricoid cartilage just above the tracheal rings there. Uh, above that cartilage is the cricothyroid membrane. And right above the membrane is the thyroid cartilage. And then not shown on that schematic also some vasculature and the thyroid gland is in that area too. So the technique for retrograde intubation includes the puncture of the cricothyroid membrane with a needle, then pass a guide wire through the cricothyroid needle aimed superiorly so that the distal end of the wire may be retrieved from the mouth or, if desired, the nose of the patient. And then withdraw the needle off the wire. Load an endotracheal tube over the oral or nasal end of the wire, passing the wire into the tube through the Murphy's eye. Pull the wire relatively taut and straight. Advance the endotracheal tube over the wire into the trachea to the cricoid area, then gradually relaxing the cricothyroid end of the wire advance the endotracheal tube to the appropriate endotracheal location. Then release the cricothyroid end of the wire and withdraw the wire out of the endotracheal tube. 
Indications for this technique include predicted difficult airways, if the patient has copious secretions or blood in the airway, or failure of other intubation techniques with preserved ability to ventilate because this is not an emergent technique. Contraindications include lack of familiarity of the technique, laryngeal trauma, laryngeal stenosis, distorted or unrecognizable landmarks. Uh, a relative contraindication would be a bleeding diesthesis. Uh, and if there's severe hypoxia or inability to ventilate, you would not use this technique. As I said, this is not an emergent technique. Complications include sore throat or hoarseness, trauma to the larynx, bleeding, infection, inadvertent puncture of the esophagus, the wire may pass distally in the trachea, uh, oral or nasal trauma, or folding of the endotracheal tube, all can occur. Next, we're going to switch to the ASA difficult airway algorithm. This slide's very busy and has a lot of parts to the algorithm, but we're going to break down those part, all these things into four parts. The first is to assess the likelihood and the clinical impact of basic management problems. Is there going to be difficulty with patient cooperation or consent? Do you think it might be a difficult mask ventilation? What about possibly a difficult supraglottic airway placement? A difficult laryngoscopy? A difficult intubation? Or even difficult surgical airway access? These should all be assessed prior to inducing your patient. Next, you want to actively pursue all opportunities to deliver supplemental oxygen through the process of difficult airway management. Three, consider the relative merits and the feasibility of basic management choices, such as awake intubation versus intubation after induction of general anesthesia, non-invasive techniques versus invasive techniques for the initial approach to intubation, video-assisted laryngoscopy as an initial approach to intubation, and preservation versus ablation of spontaneous ventilation. And then number four, we we'll develop primary and alternative strategies. An awake intubation for a difficult airway or intubation after induction with general anesthesia. If intubation attempts are unsuccessful, then you need to ask the question, is face mask ventilation adequate? If it is, then you're on the non-emergent pathway and have lots of choices of techniques to use to intubate the patient. If the answer is no, face mask ventilation is not adequate, and you're not able to intubate or to ventilate, then you're on the emergent pathway. So starting with the non-emergent pathway, where you can ventilate but not intubate the patient with uh, normal means, then you want to look at alternative approaches. These include video-assisted laryngoscopy, alternative laryngoscope blades, a uh, supraglottic airway device such as an LMA or an intubating LMA, a conduit with or without fiber optic guidance, fiber optic intubation, intubating stylet tube changer, a light wand, or blind oral or nasal intubation. However, if you cannot intubate and cannot ventilate the patient, then you're on the emergent pathway. First thing you need to do is call for help. I cannot stress that enough. It's the number one most important thing in the emergent pathway is if you cannot intubate, cannot ventilate the patient, the first thing you should do is call for help as you're reaching for your next device to intubate or to help to try to ventilate the patient. Your choices for emergent non-invasive airway ventilation include a supraglottic airway, an SGA. These include, as I mentioned, an LMA, laryngeal mask airway, an intubating LMA, a laryngeal tube or a comba tube or your other choice is emergent invasive airway access, such as surgical or percutaneous airway or jet ventilation. And we'll be talking about all these different things uh, as we go the remainder of this talk. Devices. Flexible fiber optic bronchoscope, as seen below this slide. Indications would be a predicted difficult intubation, immobile cervical spine, Difficult laryngoscopy with preserved mask ventilation. Contraindications 
emergent intubations, so if you're in the emergent pathway, this is not a device to use. If you have an uncooperative patient, or copious blood and secretions in the airway, or inaccessibility of oral and nasal cavities. Complications include the inability to visualize the airway, usually secondary to secretions or tip of the scope being obscured, misplacement of the tracheal tube, trauma to the larynx, patient intolerance, in inability to pass the endotracheal tube, or epistaxis, especially if you're using, obviously, the nasal approach. Next is the rigid bronchoscope, pictured below. These are very useful in placement of endotracheal tube when there's difficulty aligning the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes, particularly patients with cervical spine immobilization or atlanto-occipital joint disease. And the contraindications, as well as the complications, are very similar to the flexible fibrotic bronchoscopes. Next is video laryngoscopes, shown below is a glide scope. These devices include the glide scope, but there's others, such as the Pentax AWS, the CMAX stores, the Bullard laryngoscope, the Upshur scope, or the Woo scope. Indications for video laryngoscopes include predicted difficult intubation, but predicted ability to ventilate the patient, potential or known cervical spine injury, poor laryngoscope grade during direct laryngoscopy. Contraindications such as copious blood or secretions in the airway, inaccessibility of the oral cavity, upper airway obstruction, or pharyngeal or laryngeal trauma. Complications include pharyngeal or dental trauma, laryngeal trauma from the endotracheal tube or the rigid stylet, endotracheal tube misplacement, or prolonged intubation attempts with hypoxia. <clears throat> Next device are, light, are transillumination devices such as a light wand. Light wand is pictured below. Other devices in this category include trach lights and optical stylets. Indications for these devices, again, difficult laryngoscopy, copious secretions of blood in the airway, can be used for routine intubation, and also for patients with potential or known cervical spine injury. Contraindications include laryngeal trauma, hypoxic patient who cannot be ventilated, obstruction or distortion of the upper airway, grossly obese patients, typically with a BMI of greater than 30, reduces the chance of success with these devices. And, and in awake patients, uh, these devices wouldn't be used. Complications include misplaced endotracheal tube and inadvertent withdrawal of the endotracheal tube when lighted stellates pulled back, the inability to transilluminate, particularly in obese patients, the inability to advance the endotracheal tube, possible trauma to the larynx or pharynx, regurgitation, aspiration, and hoarseness. Next, talk a little bit about laryngoscope blades. These are all known as retractable blades, and they include the straight blades, such as the Miller, Phillips, or Wisconsin, curved blades, such as the Macintosh, the Bizarri, Guafrida, the McCoy, the Choi, the Improved View Macintosh, the Nishikawa, the Silker, or the Bell Scope. Now talking about different alternatives and adjuncts to the airway, starting with laryngeal mask airway. We have an example of some common laryngeal mask airways to the left on the picture and to the right, the intubating, or also known as the fast-tracked LMA. There are different types of LMAs. The LMA Unique, the LMA Ambu Aura Once, the Proceal LMA, which also has a gastric port with it, the LMA Supreme, which too has a gastric port, the intubating LMA, such as a fast track, there's also AirQ reusable and AMBU R01. And there's different sizes. There's adult through pediatric. Adult typically is sizes 5, 4, and 3, and children sizes, pediatric sizes, are uh, 2, 1, and 0. So indications for LMAs include routine airways, difficult laryngoscopy, difficult ventilation, it's a good choice for cannot intubate, cannot ventilate scenario. And a bridge to fiber optic ventilation is another, um, or bridge to fiber optic intubation is another one. Contraindications include severe upper airway obstruction, inaccessibility of the oral cavity, 
uh, full stomach or potential for regurgitation. This, of course, applies for the elective use of these devices. Or for planned positive pressure ventilation if the peak airway pressures will exceed 20 centimeters of water. Complications include regurgitation or aspiration of stomach contents, failure to seal over the glottis because of inadequate ventil this can cause inadequate ventilation, uh, gas leak at high inspiratory pressures greater than 30 uh, centimeters of water. This device may stimulate swallowing, cough, or hiccups. Also may cause laryngospasm, pharyngeal trauma, or nerve injury due to compression of cranial nerves 9, 10, or 12. The next alternative or adjunct airway device is the esophageal obturator airway. A combo tube is used as an example in the picture below. The types of the esophageal obturators include the combo tube, which comes in regular and small adult sizes, but no pediatric size. The King LT and the LTS, they do have pediatric through adult sizes for those. Both of these are pharyngeal and esophageal cuffed devices. Indications include the elective airway and emergent ventilation when face mask ventilation fails. Contraindications include inaccessibility of the oral cavity, a full stomach or aspiration risk, again, except in emergencies, and severe supraglottic obstruction. Complications, inability to ventilate, potential pharyngeal or esophageal trauma, regurgitation or aspiration of gastric contents, possible pharyngeal mucosal injury or injury to nerves secondary to overinflation. Next alternative and adjunct device for the airway is the occlusive pharyngeal airways. The example is a cobra that, uh, shown below. Types of these devices in addition to the cobra include the streamlined liner of the pharyngeal airway known as SLIPA, S-L-I-P-A, Indications and contraindications as well as complications for these devices are all similar to esophageal obturator airways. Next we're going to move to transcutaneous or surgical airways. Starting with tracheostomy, by definition it's a surgical procedure to create an opening through the neck into the trachea. A tube is usually placed through this opening to provide an airway and to remove secretions from the lungs. This tube is called a tracheostomy tube or a trach tube. Below is a picture of uh, a tracheostomy. Indications include prolonged ventilatory support, improvement in pulmonary toilet, upper airway obstruction, severe airway or facial trauma, and extensive head and neck surgery for cancer. Contraindications are emergent situations of progressive hypoxemia, lack of familiarity of technique, and two relative contraindications include distorted landmarks, or coagulopathy. Complications include bleeding, infection, extraluminal placement of the tube, decannulation with loss of airway, pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, tracheal stenosis, or tracheoesophageal fistula. Next is cricothyrotomy, shown below in a cadaver, a small tube being put through the cricothyroid membrane into the trachea. Again, by definition, it's the insertion of a tracheal tube through an incision in the cricothyroid membrane in order to establish a rapid definitive airway. Indications include failure to intubate or ventilate. When means of intubation are precluded, the patient has laryngeal trauma above the cricothyroid membrane, inaccessibility of the oral cavity, severe upper airway obstruction, thermal or caustic injury to the upper airway, or epiglottitis and croup. Contraindications include laryngeal disruption with retraction of distal trachea into mediastinum, a child that is less than eight years old, laryngeal stenosis, cancer, or infection, which are relative contraindication, and other relative contraindications include lack of familiarity of the technique, distorted landmarks, coagulopathy. Complications include bleeding, infection, extraluminal placement of the tube, pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, subglottic stenosis, tracheoesophageal fistula, or laryngeal trauma. Next is transtracheal jet ventilation. As pictured below, the device of the actual uh, ventilator, and to the right, a uh, large bore uh, needle with catheter. 
definition of transtracheal jet ventilation is a type of high frequency, low tidal volume ventilation provided via a needle catheter placed through the cricothyroid membrane into the trachea. And the needle then is removed while the catheter is left in place. Indications for this technique include failure to intubate or ventilate when means of intubation are precluded, inaccessibility of the oral cavity in patient requiring emergent ventilation, severe upper airway obstruction, or severe facial trauma. Contraindications would be bleeding diastasis, severe supraglottic obstruction, difficult anatomy prohibiting identification of the cricothyroid membrane. And complications include pneumomide mediastinum, pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, laryngeal or esophageal perforation, catheter displacement or kinking, hemodynamic changes secondary to air trapping or high peak inspiratory pressures. Next, we'll talk about endobronchial intubation. Indications for endobronchial intubation are absolute indications such as single lung isolation if a patient has unilateral infection or massive hemorrhage. Also, another absolute indication includes control of the distribution of ventilation, such in, as in patients with bronchopleural fistula, bronchopleural cutaneous fistula, giant unilateral lung cysts, or tracheobronchial tree disruption. Another absolute indication for endobronchial intubation includes unilateral bronchopulmonary lavage, such as patients with pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Then relative indications for endobronchial intubation include surgical exposure, upper lobectomy, pneumonectomy, thoracoscopy, or aortic aneurysm resection. Types of tubes used for endobronchial intubation include double lumen tubes, known as DLTs. These are essentially two tubes bonded together. It allows for each tube segment to ventilate a specific lung and these are designed as right and left sided tubes. Below is a picture of a double lumen tube. The advantages of double lumen tubes include allowing independent ventilation of either lung, better suctioning through the tube, and easier to use CPAP or partial lung inflation. Disadvantages include intubation may be more difficult than single lumen tubes, may contribute more to airway damage, more difficult to exchange than a single lumen tube, and more difficult to wean ICU patients from double lumen tubes. Another type of endobronchial uh, intubation, another type of tube, is a single lumen tube, or an SLT, with a blocker. These can be used in situations where lung isolation is required, but the use of double lumen tube is not practical. You can insert a blocking device down the tube to place into the bronchus to be isolated, it can be used for patients with very small airways. Big disadvantages, however, are slow lung deflation, difficult secretion removal, and possible bronchial mucosal damage. This is a picture of a single lumen tube with a blocker. So different types of single lumen tube blockers include univent tubes, these are silastic single lumen tubes with a built-in integral chamber allowing advancement of the integrated blocker. It has a small lumen to facilitate lung deflation and suctioning. And these tubes are a bit thicker, meaning a larger outside diameter, than their single lumen tube counterparts. Then there are bronchial blockers. These are a blocking device that are inserted either through the lumen of a single lumen tube or outside the single lumen tube between the tracheal cuff and the trachea. Placement is confirmed by fiber optic bronchoscopy and different types of bronchial blockers include paraaxial, coaxial standalone such as Fogarty catheters, Arndt and Cohen bronchial blockers. So placement and positioning considerations when using uh, these different types of tubes. The placement of a double lumen tube is very similar to a single lumen tube but with additional maneuvers. The bronchial extension of the double lumen tube is placed through the cords. Stylet is removed before the tube is advanced. 
and then the tube can be rotated 90 degrees and advanced in the direction of the bronchial lumen. The average depth of insertion is about 29 centimeters for a 170 centimeter individual. And you can use about a 10 centimeter change in height. Um, you can increase or decrease the depth of insertion by a centimeter. Again, for every centimeter, uh, for every 10 centimeter change in height, the tube can be increased or decreased one centimeter. Then the, uh, once you advance the tube, the tracheal cuff of the tube is inflated. Then the fiber optic bronchoscope is placed through the tracheal lumen. The carina should be identified. And then the bronchial lumen must be visualized entering the appropriate main stem. And after that, the bronchial cuff of the tube can then be inflated under direct fiber optic bronchoscopy visualization. To position the tube, the most reliable method for confirmation of placement of double lumen tubes is to visualize them uh, in, with the fiber optic scope as mentioned above. Determination and orientation of the right versus left main stem bronchus is done by determining the anterior and posterior aspects of the trachea, realizing that the anterior trachea is identified by its tracheal rings. Post-op considerations include changing a double lumen tube to a single lumen tube for post-operative ventilation. Uh, this can be done under direct visualization with direct laryngoscopy, but may need to be done with use of an airway exchange catheter. Next, talk about intubation and tube changing adjuncts. The bougie, also known as Eschmann's stylet, is shown below. These are semi-rigid guiding catheters. Once placed through the cords, you should fill the tracheal rings as it's advanced. Then a tracheal tube can then be slid over it into the trachea. Again, these are known as gum elastic bougies or Eschmann's stylets and can be used during the non-emergent pathway of the ASA difficult airway algorithm. Indications for bougies include poor laryngoscopy grade, such as a Cormac View 3, if the patient has a small glottic aperture, or suspected cervical spine injury requiring intubation, or an anterior larynx. Contraindications would be laryngeal disruption or an accessibility of the oral cavity, while complications include misplacement of the endotracheal tube into the esophagus, tracheal rings that may not be felt on advancement, trauma to the larynx or bronchus, or if the endotracheal tube can be advanced too far into the main stem bronchus. Now talking about tube change devices, there are different types. Endotracheal ventilation catheter, uh, Sheridan TTX, which are uh, tracheal tube exchangers. These are available in four diameters and two lengths. And then there are Cook Airway Exchange catheters. These two are available in four diameters and two lengths. These have two distal side holes and an end hole, and a jet ventilation connector can be placed on one end, and ventilation can be achieved through this device. Next, we'll talk about endotracheal tube types. Tubes come in different materials, such as polyvinyl chloride, which is most common. They can be silicone, uh, laser resistant, or silver impregnated. Tube tip design. There's Murphy's Eye, which is a side port at the end of the tube to allow ventilation even if the main port becomes blocked. <clears throat> there's flexible tip, there's movable tip, and short bevel designs. Different cuff designs. There's high volume, low pressure, and this cuff pressure should not exceed 25 torr because mucosal ischemia can occur above this pressure. There are cuffed versus uncuffed tubes and different cuff shapes. For cuff pressure management, one can use lands valves, active management, uh, pilot balloons, which are most common on the tubes we use each day, or inflation valves. Specific tube types include wire reinforced, known as anode tubes. These have metal wire or nylon filament that's embedded into its wall. Uh, stylets are needed for intubation with these tubes. There's endotrols. These have built-in stylets and very useful for blind nasal or difficult oral intubations. Also, there are oral rays, nasal rays, microlaryngeal, and supraglottic secretion suctioning tubes. And lastly, in the general anesthesia talk, 
ASA monitoring standards. Uh, the ASA standard monitors for patients include pulse oximetry, blood pressure monitoring, ECG monitoring, capnography, temperature monitoring should at least be available, oxygen analyzer when doing general anesthesia, and circuit disconnect arm for general anesthesia.